Hello all you freedom loving people. Welcome to another episode of Front Page International. I'm your host, Scott Cameron Goulet. Hunter Biden may just get charged with a felony yet. After Hunter's sweetheart deal fell through that sought to pardon Hunter for future charges if he pled guilty to a misdemeanor tax charge, he may get indicted for a felony regarding his possession of a firearm while he was addicted to illegal drugs. And James Comer continues to uncover more evidence to prove Joe Biden's abuse of power and his involvement in the Biden family's foreign business influence peddling schemes. A major victory has been scored in Arizona for election integrity after it was ruled that Arizona's signature matching is unlawful. Blinken made a surprise visit to Ukraine in order to offer another billion dollars more in aid, making for a total of more than $43.2 billion so far. Biden is heading to India for the G20 meetings. Hopefully he will garner support for the development banks in order to counter China's coercive lending programs through the Belt and Road Initiative. An electric vehicle battery plant in Michigan has been shown to have ties to the CCP, so much so that employees make vows to fight for communism to the end. And the Nobel Foundation withdrew its invitation for representatives from Russia, Belarus, and Iran to attend this year's Nobel Prize Award ceremony. Okay, let's get into it. According to a new filing from U.S. prosecutors, Hunter Biden may be charged with a felony gun crime. Special counsel David Weiss's team said in a September 6 filing that prosecutors plan to ask a grand jury to indict Hunter Biden for a felony crime before the end of the month. Weiss's team told a federal court in Delaware that the Speedy Trial Act requires that the government obtain the return of an indictment by a grand jury by Friday, September 29, 2023, at the earliest. The government intends to seek the return of an indictment in this case before that date. The filing was made upon a court order to provide a status update on the case on or before September 6, 2023. However, it is unknown at this point what charges exactly Hunter Biden might face. At the very least, Hunter lied on a federal form about his addiction in order to get a firearm. Hunter Biden owned a firearm in October of 2018, even with an addiction to an illegal drug. According to prosecutors, this was a violation of federal law. So they previously agreed to allow Hunter to enter a pre-trial diversion agreement, but that deal has since fallen through. The plea deal that was crafted by Weiss and Hunter Biden fell apart after the judge scrutinized the deal in August. The agreement allowed Hunter Biden to plead guilty to a misdemeanor for not paying taxes on over $1.5 million in income in 2017 and 2018. In addition, Weiss drafted a separate diversion agreement that gave Hunter Biden immunity from potential future charges such as the gun charge. The tax agreement included a provision to wipe out the felony gun violation from his criminal record. U.S. District Judge Mary Ellen Narika, who is the judge that's overseeing the case, ordered the parties to provide updates. By September 6, Narika's order requires filing an indictment soon after an arrest or summons. A conviction could land Hunter Biden in prison for up to 10 years. In other breaking news related to Hunter Biden, House Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer has asked the National Archives to provide unrestricted access to currently redacted communications between then Vice President Joe Biden's office and business associates of Hunter Biden. Comer sent a letter to the National Archives and Records Administration to NARA on September 6, and he demanded unrestricted special access to the NARA records, which are titled Records on Hunter Biden, James Biden, and their foreign business dealings. Comer said that the committee needs access to the records because he expects that they will provide further evidence of collusion between the Biden family and then Vice President Joe Biden's office, and the records will prove that Joe Biden engaged in abuse of power. Comer stated that Joe Biden never built an absolute wall between his family business dealings and his official government work his office doors were wide open to Hunter Biden's associates. 
There has been a massive win for election integrity in Arizona after a judge ruled that the signature matching process for mail-in ballots is unlawful. You have a Pie County judge, John Knapper, recently ruled in favor of the Arizona Free Enterprise Club and restoring integrity and trust in elections. This is a recent lawsuit against Arizona Secretary of State Adrian Fontes. The lawsuit alleges that Fontes broke the law regarding mail-in ballot signature verification procedures. Specifically, the groups argue that Fontes' interpretation of registration record in the Secretary of State's election procedures manual was unreasonably broad. They also argue that Fontes' interpretation improperly expanded the pool of signatures to which an early ballot affidavit signature could be compared. This increased the risk of false positives for signature matches. The judge noted in his order that the court finds the plaintiffs have correctly defined registration record. Registering to vote is not the same as voting, applying the plain and obvious meaning of registration. The legislature intended for the recorder to attempt to match the signature on the outside of the envelope to the signature on the documents that the putative voters used to register. Former gubernatorial candidate Carrie Lake, who previously sued Fontes and Maricopa County officials, stated in a post on X that a court just found that Arizona's signature matching process is unlawful. That is what happens when you don't back down from a fight. During a surprise visit to Kiev on September 6, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken announced a more than $1 billion aid package for Ukraine. This was Blinken's fourth trip to Kiev since the Ukraine war began in February of 2022 at a press conference ahead of his meeting with Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba. Blinken emphasized the U.S. commitment to bolstering Ukraine's ability to confront and deter short- and long-term aggression. The new package includes more than $665 million in funding for military and civilian security assistance. It also includes millions more to support Ukraine's air defense and other areas. The new package has increased U.S. security assistance to Ukraine to more than $43.2 billion so far. The Pentagon also announced a $175 million package for weaponry, for air defense equipment, artillery rounds, and anti-tank weapons. The Pentagon stated that this latest funding installment is allocated under the $6.2 billion presidential drawdown authority. The Biden administration also has authorized $2.9 billion in humanitarian aid and $20.5 billion for Ukraine through the World Bank initiatives. During his surprise visit, Blinken noted that he discussed long-term security arrangements with President Zelensky. He also highlighted the training of Ukrainian pilots of F-16s in the United States as part of the long-term international commitment to Ukraine's needs. Blinken also noted that U.S.-made Abrams tanks are set to arrive in the fall. Joe Biden left Washington on Thursday in order to attend the G20 summit in India. Joe Biden's trip was questioned after Joe Biden tested positive for COVID-19 recently. However, according to the White House, Joe Biden has tested negative and he has not shown any symptoms. According to the comprehensive schedule that was released late on Wednesday, Joe Biden will meet Indian Prime Minister Modi after a long haul flight on Friday. Biden will also participate in a dinner and cultural program with G20 leaders. Later, Biden will meet with the heads of the top of industrial nations in New Delhi on Sunday. Then, Biden heads for Hanoi, where he will hold a press conference and meet with the General Secretary of the Communist Party of Vietnam. Notably, Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin will not be attending the G20 summit. However, the India-China conflict and the Ukraine war will be the underlying subjects. Biden's key priority at the G20 is to propose strengthening of multilateral development banks, especially the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. This is an alternative to China's coercive lending program. China, which has become the world's largest creditor in recent years, has been criticized for its lending strategy under the Belt and Road Initiative. Since its launch in 2013, 
China's Belt and Road Initiative has invested billions of dollars into infrastructure projects across Africa, Latin America, Eastern Europe, and Asia. In recent years, however, Beijing has been accused of using debt trap diplomacy to lure many nations under its influence. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan noted at a press conference briefing on September 5th that we believe that there should be a high standard of non-coercive lending options available to low and middle income countries. This is why the United States advocates fundamentally reshaping and scaling up these development banks. However, to avoid enraging the Chinese Communist Party, Sullivan downplayed the main purpose of the strengthening of the multilateral banks, and he claimed that it isn't about China. However, that's starkly contrasted with what Sullivan said two weeks ago when it was clear that the entire campaign was centered on countering China's Belt and Road Initiative. Sullivan told reporters during a conference call on August 22nd that given both the scale of the need and frankly the scale of China's coercive and unsustainable lending through the Belt and Road Initiative, we need to ensure that there are high standards, high leverage solutions to the challenges countries are facing. But whether Joe Biden can unite other countries against the CCP during the summit is unclear. As a part of the effort, Biden asked Congress to provide an additional $3.3 billion for the World Bank in its latest supplemental budget request last month. Stephanie Segal, who is a senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, explained that the timing is right for the United States to highlight those development banks as an alternative to China. Last year, the group of seven, the G7 countries, proposed a new infrastructure investment program for developing countries. This program is known as the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment, and its goal is to compete with China's Belt and Road Initiative. Italy, which is the only G7 country that joined the Belt and Road Initiative four years ago, has recently announced its intention to withdraw from the program. Italian Foreign Minister Antonio Tajani noted that the Belt and Road Initiative deal with China has failed to meet Italian expectations. A China-based company that is behind a U.S. taxpayer-funded electric vehicle battery plant in Michigan has published reports showing some employees raising their fists and pledging loyalty to the Chinese Communist Party, while others tour a museum wearing what looks like red army uniforms. Goshen High Tech is the China-based parent company of Goshen Incorporated. Goshen develops an EV battery in a plant near Big Rapids, Michigan. Reportedly, Goshen Incorporated secured $1 billion in U.S. taxpayer support for the Michigan factory at an overall cost of $2.4 billion. The company recently published reports and video footage showing its staffers participating in pro-communist activities at an apparent work retreat. Records show that during the summer of 2021, employees of Goshen High Tech went on field trips to communist revolutionary memorials in China. They dressed in red army outfits and they pledged to fight for communism to the end of their lives. A second trip occurred a month later when the company took staff to Dabe Mountain in China. There, they paid homage to the CCP's Long March, which was a retreat by communist forces in the 1930s that was celebrated by the CCP as a military victory. Employees during the second trip also wore Red Army uniforms and they sang pro-communist songs. However, following concerns about the trips, a company spokesperson for Goshen told Fox News that its parent company didn't fund the excursions. Goshen's North American Manufacturing Vice President Chuck Thielen also has dismissed concerns about its parent company having links to the CCP. He said that Goshen is not Chinese-owned. However, it is important to remember that all companies in China, including their foreign subsidiaries, are required to have a CCP office in order to supervise operations. In a document, it is stated that the Goshen Incorporated, 
which is based in California, is wholly owned and controlled by Goshen High Tech, and Goshen High Tech is based in eastern China. The document also stated that Goshen Incorporated is not supervised, directed, or financed by a foreign government, foreign political party, or other foreign principles. Goshen Incorporated in Michigan is, however, completely controlled by Goshen High Tech in China. And when asked if the foreign principal, meaning Goshen Incorporated, would engage in political activities, Goshen answered yes. Morton Klein, the head of the Zionist Organization of America, expressed support for Elon Musk's concerns over the Anti-Defamation League. Recently, Elon Musk threatened to retaliate against efforts by the Anti-Defamation League to cut off ad revenue for X. Musk also warned the Anti-Defamation League about the disclosure of communications with the League. According to the Zionist Organization of America, both Jews and Israel are at risk from the Anti-Defamation League's alleged censorship actions. Klein stated that he sympathizes with Musk and his concerns about Jonathan Greenblatt's Anti-Defamation League. Greenblatt, who is a former Obama staffer, is currently the head of the Anti-Defamation League. Previously, the Zionist Organization of America accused the Anti-Defamation League of fighting very hard to get X to suspend anti-woke accounts such as libs of TikTok. Last year, the Zionist Organization of America called for a full overhaul of the Anti-Defamation League, along with Greenblatt's firing over the promotion of woke leftism. The Zionist Organization of America also called out Greenblatt for falsely accusing Senator Ted Cruz of anti-Semitism. Recently, the Nobel Foundation withdrew its invitation for representatives of Russia, Belarus, and Iran to attend this year's Nobel Prize Award ceremonies. This was after the Nobel Foundation announced on Friday that they had invited the representatives of these three countries. As a result, several Swedish lawmakers protested the decision and they announced that they would boycott the organization. Some of the lawmakers cited the Ukraine war and Iran's crackdown on human rights as reasons for their boycott. In response, the foundation said on Saturday that it recognized the strong reactions of Sweden, so it had decided not to invite the Russian, Belarus and Iran ambassadors to the ceremony in Stockholm for the Science and Literature Awards. However, the Norwegian Nobel Committee that awards the Nobel Peace Prize said it would follow its usual practice and invite all ambassadors to the ceremony in the Norwegian capital of Oslo, where the Nobel Prize was awarded. Okay, this is our show for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you like what you heard today, please don't forget to like this video and share it with your friends and family because everybody deserves to know the truth. Again, thank you for watching Front Page and we will see you next time.